Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Pounding the Table. We have the special opportunity today. We have Peter Beck from Rocket Labs. So we are very excited to dive in. You guys have obviously a lot going on. But for those who don't know you, could you just give a, a very high level of, of your background and, and what Rocket Lab does for the retail investors of the world? Yeah, sure. So I started the company way back in 2006. You'll notice that I talk funny. That's because I'm a New Zealander and they come from New Zealand. The company is, I took the Rocket Lab to the US in 2013. So we've been a US company since 2013. But the easiest way to describe us is, is an end-to-end -end space company. So we're most well known for our launch vehicles, namely the Electron rocket. But also we build satellites and, and provide a, a large number of satellites and space systems. And we even operate and manage spacecraft and spacecraft and orbit. Yeah, an end-to-end in -end space company. And did you come from a background? Were you in as like a rocket scientist or what was your, what was your background? Because I was watching the Bloomberg episode <laughs> and I think he mentioned that you were actually helping great like dishwashers, I believe he said he mentioned initially. Mm. So I'd love to hear like what initially brought you or your early fascinations with space or what inspired the creation of Rocket Lab. I was lucky that right from the youngest age I can remember, I always wanted to work in space. My father took me outside when I was little and uh, we looked at the night sky and he pointed out all the stars and then that those stars most likely have planets and there could be somebody on one of those planets looking back at you. And that that was really the moment like, wow, this is much bigger than everything else that that's around me. And the original goal was to go and work for NASA or a, a, a space company. From a small town at the very bottom of New Zealand, options are somewhat limited to work in the space industry. In fact, the, prior to Rocket Lab, New Zealand had zero space industry. My, I set a, a goal that I wanted to work in the space industry and, and started at it and divided my life up into two shifts. The first shift being the day job, if you will, and the second shift being the, the rocket shift. It really began, because as, as you mentioned, my journey was at a company called Fisher & Paykel that excuse me, built whiteware appliances and dishwashers. And really, I started as a tool and die maker as, a, as an engineer. And my rationale for that is that th there was no university courses for space or aerospace. In order to learn the things I needed to learn, I needed to build them. So I started building rockets when I was still at school. So the plan was to go and get a, a trade and then go to university and uh, end up at NASA. And it, it turned out that way. We ended up flying spacecraft to NASA for the moon. It was just on my rocket, not, not one of theirs. We, we skipped forward 20 years, but that, that was in the generalized approach. Amazing. Question for you. So I reference this all the time on the pod, as the listeners know, that there's a couple of thematics that I'm absolutely bullish on for the rest of the decade. The first one, AI came absolutely strong this year with generative AI. Next is quantum computing. The third is the space frontier. So what are you what do you think the biggest challenges and opportunities are facing that space industry for the next couple of years or even next decade? Yeah, I think I agree with your thesis on that one. I think the biggest thing that to be done in space is yet to even be thought of. We're, we're mucking around the fringes with putting a few few kind of interesting things up into orbit. I would I always point to GPS and I often get asked the question, how does space even affect me? And the reality is that GPS just enables everything from your pizza delivery to your aircraft. It's become absolutely fundamental in that space infrastructure. So I think it is an exciting time in the future. And in my lifetime, we've witnessed and we're lucky to have been part of the democratization of space. Like when I was a young school kid wanting to work for NASA, there was no such thing as a private company building rockets. Like it was all government. In a very short time frame, that's changed quite significantly. And I don't see that rate of change decreasing anytime soon um, because it, it's like it's every new domain. If you take shipping or even air travel, the domain of air travel was you know, military and then it, it grew and evolved and technologies were developed and became a little bit more commercial, but for the really rich person. And then now it's just, this for me at least anyway skipping from new zealand to america it's just like a taxi it's just like standard mode of transport and i think the same evolution or revolution will, will happen in space but i guess the way i view the space industry evolving is probably somewhat different to 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 a few at least i think the really large 
space companies of the future are not going to be companies that just do launch, not going to be companies that just build satellites. They're going to be the end-to-end space companies that do it all. And you just see the huge power that, that that brings when you start to combine those things together. Before we pass off to Nico, I also want to comment, like we mentioned all the time, like how do you find multi-baggers or stocks are about to be strong growth stocks for next couple of years? It's finding these category leaders and what they do, and they have a network effect. Rocket Lab fits both those criteria, like Peter said, the end-to-end solution in this sp- specific space frontier, and they are they have a duopoly right now in these launches. Thank you for that, Peter. Nico, before Nico goes, sorry, Nico, <laughs> cut you off. I did want to ask about that because that is really interesting. Working mm. internationally, I imagine with something as big as sending a rocket to space, you have to be in coordination with governments, right? So they make sure that no company is just sending up spy satellites mm-hmm. or anything like that. As much as you could, can you share about some of that collaboration and initial conversations? with the government of how you get approval and do they have people Mm. that are before each launch making sure they know what's going up to space? Man, we we could do a whole podcast on just that. It's a huge, (laughs) it's a huge element. We were the first and still are the first and the only private company that owns and operates their launch site that's capable of and have delivered stuff to orbit. And we operate a private orbital launch range in a foreign country being New Zealand. If you want to talk about regulation, I think one third of my career was a pseudo diplomat because we had to negotiate bilateral treaties between New Zealand and America. Mm-hmm. Then you have all of the ITAR rules and non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction technology and all of the licenses that need to go for that. And then it's funny, when we started launching down in New Zealand, we had to change and create a whole bunch of new rules. There was no space agency, so a space agency got created. There was no rules or laws about going to orbit, so all of those got created. And the craziest thing, things happened, there was every every time we, we sent a payload to orbit, at least in theory, our customer was going to get a, an export tax because it was technically leaving the country. So we had to get a new rules and made space. Actually, in New Zealand, space is a freight destination. So there's a temporary import-export rule. And then you bring the rocket home and it's like you reuse the rocket, then there's a whole bunch of now you brought the rocket back. A whole lot of new laws and rules and stuff that that all had to be created for us to do what we do. And then to your point, we fly under an FAA launch license. If we're flying out of our NASA Wallops range, we also have flying under a NASA license. And then when we fly out of New Zealand, we have the FAA launch license and a New Zealand license. So there's a a lot of checks and balances and a lot of kind of regulatory hoops that you have to go through. And those regulatory hoops are really focused around two things. One, public safety, which is paramount, and two, orbital debris. So keeping it safe in space as well. There's there's a lot of work there, but they're focused on the right thing. Yes. So one of the most that your company does have, like you just mentioned, is you can launch in New Zealand. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like, 120, 125 launches a year you can do at that specific complex. Do you know what the max capacity is on all the launch ports in the US? Because I know that's something that other competitors can't really do internationally. They're capped in that box domestically. Do you have that number in mind? Yeah, I don't. But out of we know that out of the, the LC1 launch range in New Zealand, we have generally large, more launch capacity than most launch sites globally simply because it is a private range and that's what it's licensed to to be able to deliver. And that was part of the reason why we, we actually built a launch site in New Zealand was if you looked at the Cape and a lot of the other, the Andy and a lot of the ranges is super busy. And the other key element is that you have to vertically integrate not just the rocket, but the range when you're building a small launch vehicle. A small launch vehicle is vastly more difficult to build than a large launch vehicle. The only delta is that the, the, the cost of the infrastructure is affordable. That's really the only delta. But technically, it's harder. And then from a business standpoint, it's harder as well because no no flight safety analyst team cares if the rocket is you know 1.2 meters in diameter or 10 meters in diameter. The same amount of work has to happen. So there's a, a baseline load of functions that you need, whether it be quality. Like a quality guy doesn't care if it's a 2-inch valve or a 12-inch valve. Still need the quality team. So the, the challenge with a small launch vehicle is you actually have to amortize those functions over to a much, much smaller, thicker price. So if you've got a $65 million rocket, you can have 50 people in your flight safety team. If you've got a $7.5 million rocket, you can have 
one person in your safety team. And the way that we got around all of that is, is being super smart and automating and coming up with really new and innovative solutions to solving these kind of tricky people problems. This is why when I look at Neutron and we think we, we, we're going to bring that to market, why we think we can be competitive is because we have been like intentionally starved. We're the skinniest people you can imagine on the planet to be able to do these kinds of things. So when we look at a big rocket, we don't, we, we're not coming into that with a 50, 50 person flight safety team. We're coming into that with, I think, I think we technically have three, not one, but, but a very small lean organization. Yeah, uh, thank you for um, explaining about Neutron. And I want to continue with this topic. As we can read, the schedule foresees that you want to launch um, Neutron the first time at the end of 2024. And as I can read at the moment, there could be only one small bottleneck that could be Archimedes, the engine of Neutron. Can you give us maybe some hints what the current status of achievement is? Yeah, sure. I'll preface everything with it is a rocket program. We're in a we're in a honeymoon period where hardware is rich. We're hardware rich, but we're figuring out all the things that work and all the things don't work that don't work. And I've been through this grind this meat grinder once before. And yep, look, Archimedes is propulsion is generally the long pole in the tent. I would say that if we look at the vehicle, and I'll come and answer your question, but more generally, if you look at the vehicle, where does the biggest risk lie? Actually, the, the bit that's innovative in the rocket is the materials and the, the, the design and, and the, the method of construction. So that's why we focused on doing the second stage tank test first, because that is actually the highest, it's not the highest risk element of the design of the vehicle. Because it's a disposable upper stage, you have competing factors that it has to be the highest performance, but also the lowest cost. Uh, and generally, those two things don't go together. And we can talk about all the smart architectures that we've employed uh, to, to go and do that. But I would encourage any, anybody to go into YouTube and have a look at some of the tank testing videos. And you can see that the tank is very large. The thing that I think most people don't realize is that whole tank weighs slightly heavier than a Harley Davidson. It's a five meter, five meter diameter carbon composite tank that, that's holding tons and tons of propellant that, that weighs almost nothing. Um, and that is, that's been a, a really big technical achievement uh, for the teams and we're very happy to have that, that development behind us. That's the R&D part of the R&D. And then on Archimedes, um, we purposely chose a really high performance cycle, a closed Oxrich cycle. So generally you choose one of those cycles because you're trying to extract really high performances, really high ISPs and really high thrust to weight. Now, we chose the, the highest performing cycle, but dialed it right back. And the reason why we did that is because we want these engines to be reusable. And instead of building, instead of choosing like a gas generator cycle where you have to push right up to the edge of its kind of cycle performance to get the ISP you need, by choosing a really high performance cycle and dialing it back, we end up with a really robust engine. Well, that being said, one of the one of the kind of challenges with the closed cycle engine as compared to a gas generator is you can't separate the elements out and test them individually. You can't take a gas generator and run that up and test that individually and then take a thrust chamber and run that up and test that individually because it's all gas combustion. You really just have to build the whole engine, put it on the test stand and go. So Archimedes, it feels frustrating for me and it probably feels frustrating for other people to watch as well because it's no engine. And when we put something on the test stand, it's not like a dev pre-burner for a gas generator or anything. It's, it's the whole engine. Yeah, so that that is, you start to see some things that, that look like whole engines pretty shortly here in, in the next year. And like I say, the least innovative thing we're trying, that we're trying to have is propulsion because we just need workhorse engines. When normal kind of stage combustion cycle engines, their operation points are ours is vastly below a standard operation point. So, so one of the things I'm absolutely bullish on the Neutron is for scalability for small launches, like you need to be able to turn around quickly. The Neutron, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, you could turn around in like less than a day or 24 hours potentially, which is massive. And I think the other bullish feature of that compared to the Falcon 9 is you can land it on a drone ship. 
or you don't have to land on a drone ship where the Falcon 9 you do. And that's very costly. Can you describe some more differences between the Neutron and also like the uh, Falcon 9, essentially? That's why this f- tailwind of the Neutron is going to be so bullish for the firm. Yeah, so I think the, the fundamental difference is that the Falcon 9 was appended with items to be made reusable. And look, it's been very successful. It's wonderful. The difference with Neutron is that it was designed from a blank sheet of paper from day one to be reusable. And if you look at if you look at the Neutron and compare it to, say, the Falcon 9, they, they look vastly different vehicles. You just right down to the aspect ratio, Neutron is short and fat. Why is Neutron short and fat? Turns out the very best shape for re-entering the Earth's atmosphere from an efficient, efficiency perspective is literally the shape of a traffic cone. So the very first sketches of Neutron on a whiteboard were, were in fact a traffic cone. And then Neutron lands exactly as it looks like as it takes off with the fairings attached. We don't throw away fairings and then go and fish them out of the ocean and bring them back. We actually hold those fairings on all the way up. And then the second stage tank, as I mentioned before, is, is the paradox of the whole design. We stuck it inside the rocket so we don't have to transfer the load through the tank. And the load, the tank doesn't have to bear a structural element to the rocket. That takes an enormous amount of stress, stress out of the tank, but also mass and complexity. So it, it really is, and for me personally as an engineer, it's, it's like the super privilege to have developed a small launch vehicle and made that reusable, or at least elements of it reusable, and then get a go around where you can take all of the stuff that you've learned, all the stuff that you're not happy with, and start with a blank sheet of paper and go, this is how I would do it if, if I had no constraints. And that, that's what is with, with, with Neutron. And that's fundamentally why we, one of the, one of the reasons we believe it's going to be really competitive in the market is because it was designed to do one thing from day one. There's very few stocks in the market that have a 60% plus Kager for the next couple of years. And I think Neutron is one of those tailwinds for company. Can you describe how much of a boost this specific feature, like Neutron will be on the revenue side for the next coming years? Compared to before where like the Falcon 9, as you said, has just been so steady and reliable and like you guys, great place to launch off of your business, pun intended, the firm off of. So can you describe like what the electron will mean on the revenue side as well? Yeah, obviously the sticker price is uh, is significantly higher, sort of 50 Mm -hmm. to $55 million for the sticker price. The ASP is much greater, which gives us greater certainty around the margins as well. We're modeling the sort of a similar margin for neutron as we are electron. But all of that is in the noise when you consider what we're actually trying to do here in a, in a much bigger sense. And I keep coming back to an end-to-end space company. We've always said that like launch will be about one third of our revenue. Two thirds of our revenue will come from space systems. And that's pretty much how it is today. And we, we imagine that to be in the future. But when you think about what is having a launch vehicle is great. You can, it's a nice little business line. It's a very difficult business line, business to be in, but, and it create, it does create a lot of value. But at the end of the day, having the keys to space, if you're only going to use it for other people's stuff, then it's a bit of a lost opportunity. What an end to end space company means for Rocket Lab is, is not just launching other people's satellites into orbit, building other people's satellites. It's ultimately the end point is building and launching our own satellites and putting them in orbit and providing services. And I think if you iterate forward the whole space model, that's where it ends up. Because if you're a government or a commercial customer, today what you have to do is you have to become experts in the fields of not only operation of spacecraft, design and build a spacecraft and launch a spacecraft. If you're just a government that wants a sensor, an optical sensor over their country to measure weather. There's a tremendous amount of kind of expertise that you have to build and create, and even more so if you're a company. So I think if you fast forward, and don't quote me on the time frame here, I'm not sure what it will be, but fast forward some point in time, I fully expect customers to come to us and say, hey, Pete, we need to measure the, the right, and we need to provide communications to Hawaii this month. And you go, okay. And that's as far as the customer needs to know. If you pick up, pick it, ring up a plumber and you say, Hey, I need water in my new extension I'm building in the back of my house. They don't go, okay, you need to become an expert in plumbing, an expert in civil works and an expert in, in regulation 
it just a ditch gets dug in the ground, a pipe gets laid, and you come home one day and turn on the tap and there's water. Mm-hmm. And that's that's where I think ultimately we need to get to with space is it needs services and space need to be much more seamlessly delivered than they are today. Yeah, I think a, a big part I, of that. One one comment off before I hand it to you. The reason why it's like what Peter's saying is so like insightful is because Rocket Lab is like the one stop shop for their customers. And I do think a lot of customers have some trauma from 2021 on supply chain issues or like having multiple different partners to fulfill like for specific Rock Lab, their missions, but before it was just like their products and they don't want that anymore. They want the one stop shop. And that thing that's something that Rock Lab should be associated with as the one-stop shop for customers who want to have these kind of missions. I totally agree with what you're saying about that, Peter. Avi, you can pass yeah. it off to him. No, I think what you, piggybacking off what you guys were saying, I think as an investor and thinking through the lens, we want to understand the different revenue streams. And I think that's one thing with space in general or space companies similar to Quantum or similar to some of these other kind of far out where the basic uh, a typical person, Joe on the street, is not going to fully understand this model. So for someone like me, just trying to wrap my head around some of these different revenue models that you guys have today. So you touched on it a little bit, but can you give, I don't know, any public partnerships or how are you guys working with your clients today? And so they're paying for you to send a satellite up to the space and just dive into that a little bit further if you could. Yeah, we're already recognizing the strength of kind of the business model already. So for example, a customer would come to us and ask us to build a satellite. And we'll just use one that's on orbit right now, the spacecraft that we built for VADA for their on-orbit manufacturing. Very unique capability that the spacecraft needs to deliver a lot of power for their little factory. And then we need to re-enter that spacecraft back to the Earth's atmosphere and land it in a desert somewhere. So the spacecraft itself has a lot of propulsion on board and ability to do that. If you look at that spacecraft, it has the spacecraft obviously designed and built in Rocket Lab at Rocket Lab. All of the composite structures were designed and built by us. The radio was designed and built by us. The propulsion system was designed and built by us. The tanks were designed and built by us. The Star Tracker, the reaction wheels were designed and built by us. It's using our solar panels. It's using our software. Really, there's almost nothing on there that wasn't designed or built by us. It's using our batteries and everything. So when, when you think about being completely vertically integrated like that, the, the ability to, to, to innovate, come up with solutions and solve problems and also just the speed in which you can deliver things, it's it's pretty unfair. And I know this for a fact because when we first started building satellites in 2019, we announced that, that the Photon satellite we announced, and we thought we're going to get into this. The first thing that we did was place an order for some reaction wheels and star trackers. And that was from Sinclair Interplanetary. Doug built the most beautiful jewellery, lovely stuff, nine months. And he closed his order book in August. So if you didn't get in before August, then... Tough. It's a year and nine months. So that was the first company we went and bought. We went and bought Doug Sinclair's business, and then we scaled it from 150 reaction wheels a year to 1,000 reaction wheels a year. Uh, and when it comes to building our own platform, we never have to wait for a reaction wheel or a Star Trek ever again. Like, there is no supply chain problem. And then we did that for all of the long lead expensive items in a spacecraft. Um, Solar is another great example. So we bought a company called Solero, only one of three space-grade solar cell manufacturers in the entire world um, and the largest. Solar is, is the most expensive, the longest lead time item on a spacecraft generally, apart from payloads sometimes. Owning that and keeping control of that is is, is a huge advantage for us to be able to now compete and, and bid on much larger programs. Take the MDA Global Star Constellation that we won. Very large, very complicated spacecraft, 12-year lifetimes and wallowing in radiation environments, really difficult spacecraft to build. For that particular customer, schedule was as important as technical capability. We owned all the supply chain to be able to deliver on that schedule. So we won. And we'll see that more and more frequently, I'm, I'm imagining, as supply chain of and the constraint of supply of a lot of these systems is really hard. When we talk about an end-to-end space company, that's really what we mean. And yeah, you started with different revenue streams. And I think Rocket Lab is always hinting at the desire to develop their own space infrastructure. I think that will be the next right. step. 
what is your current vision and is it in the works and maybe is there a planning of a mega constellation regarding photons which will de orbit space junk yeah if you look at if you break up the space industry market like it's about 20 billion dollars tam of launch call it 30 to 40 billion dollars tam spacecraft 320 billion dollars of tam and space services and, and, and all the things that that basically are delivered from space so you, you can see the magnitude of the market is, is in actually delivering the services. And if you own the launch vehicle and you have the ability to build any spacecraft you want, your ability to deliver those services is always going to be better than anybody else who doesn't have their own rocket. It's that fundamental. So yes, that's, that, that's a fact. We haven't made any announcements around the infrastructure that we intend to build or any of those projects. I would say it's just a little bit early yet. We need the keys to space. We need to get neutron functioning and, and, and flying regularly and reliably. But I would say that we're, we're watching very closely all the different business models that, that are unraveling themselves in space right now. And is it direct to mobile? Is it consumer internet? What, what is it? What is that big application in orbit? And we're not making any announcements or any commitments as to what we're going to build just yet. But you can guarantee that we have all the capability or will have all the cap capability to execute on whatever we choose. And sometimes you have to hurry up and wait. And I think most of the time it's best to be the first mover. Some of the time it's best to be the second mover. And I think that's where we're sitting right now. Then I would like to go on. I'm trying to follow Rocket Lab very closely. And many times I read that one of your goals is that Rocket Lab has to be cash st 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 stable. Um, does that mean that your goal is to grow steadily and looking at your balance sheet or are you planning bigger steps in the future? Maybe raise mm. some more capital. Yeah, yeah. Look, part of the reason I took Rocket Lab public was to ensure that we build a multi-generational enduring space company. My two biggest competitors are the two wealthiest people on the planet. And that that's the reality of you have to compete against. But I would, I was determined not to end up in a scenario where if, when they put me in the ground, the company goes with it. And the way you avoid that is making sure you build a profitable company. There's lots of other things, culture and all of that. But at the end of the day, you have to build a, a, a profitable company. And space is really, the space is a, a big plus and a big minus. The big plus is it's hugely aspirational. It's very easy to get excited about. And it's, it's awesome and it's exciting. The negative side of it is that there's been way too much aspiration and not enough execution in the industry. And I, I'm all about execution. And so w while a lot of the stuff we do is exciting, at the end of the day, we have a very keen eye on making sure that we build a profitable company that is, in, that is like I say, is multi-generational and, and, and enduring. Because I want the things that Rocket Lab achieves to go on well and well after I'm, I'm gone. I think that's how you have the biggest impact ultimately to society, but also to shareholders. We're a little bit different in the fact that yes, we're aspirational and, and we love space, but we also view it through a very keen commercial eye. And part of that is that we've always had to. If you look at the amount of funding that's gone into Rocket Lab as compared to most companies, especially launch companies, it's significantly less. If you compare it to the big the, the big ones, it's, it's like ridiculously less. But we've always been ruthlessly efficient with the capital that, we, that we've had. And I'm not sure how many people know this, but the, the Rutherford rocket engine wasn't named Rutherford because he, he was a famous Kiwi, of course, and he split the atom and all the rest of it. The reason why we named the Rutherford rocket engine Rutherford is because he had a very famous saying, and that was, we have no money, so we have to think. And that is literally the ethos of the company from day one through to day now. Is a lot of the innovations that are, are born about in our technical solutions, because we had to think we didn't have the capital to, to just go and waste willy-nilly and experiment. We had to get it right, and we had to build high-quality stuff that worked. Yeah, to that you mentioned it. I'm glad you mentioned it, because that's some of the headwinds of the early innings of just like this who knows the capacity of the space economy. But I do think that you found like a good middle ground between like growing the top line and you guys are anticipating potentially to be free cash flow positive in 2025 as soon as that. Question for you is, do you, unfortunately other competitors in the space economy have struggled 
tremendously the past two years due to capital markets being extremely dry, rates potentially could be higher for longer. Do you see more consolidation happening in the space industry? And is there any kind of specific avenues that you are looking to be aggressive on potentially down the line that you guys aren't mm-hmm. don't have exposure to right now? Yeah, yeah. So I, I challenged the the start of the preface is that there hasn't been the capital. There's never been more capital flown into the space industry than there is in the last few years. You're speaking to the guy who, you know, the, the Series A round out of Coza's Ventures to build Electron was $5 million. So when I see people going and raising like a hundred or hundreds of millions of dollars to go and build a rocket, it's, it's just, it, it explodes my head. It's just, the efficient the capital efficiency has been extremely low and the execution has been extremely poor. I would say the capital has been there for sure. There's been endless amounts of capital there. But more directly to your question, we'll, we'll keep our eyes open for value opportunities. I think you saw us earlier in the year we picked up Virgin Orbit facilities, stunning facilities. And mm-hmm. like we don't need to buy anything for a long time. It, it was just everything was there bravo on that fire sale wow i love that when i read that i was like and i saw the cost of that i was like geez that's like 75 that's black friday used to be like for everyone like five (laughs) years ago (laughs) yeah yeah no it it was there was there was you talk about disregard for capital like the amount of capital that went in there is staggering um and it's great that it's going to be put to good use it lives on and, and it wasn't a waste but but yeah no i think there's in 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 a in a market that less that is less frothy, then there needs to be execution. And um, uh, I think there was a lot of promises made and and very little delivered. And as a result, then this is the wonderful thing about the public markets is they're very efficient in the end, and they're very efficient at working out what are companies with a real product and with the real customers and what are what is not. I think the the last question I'd want to ask here is you alluded to Elon Musk, SpaceX, and. Uh, I think Bezos was probably the other one with the Blue Origin. So you mentioned you've been super efficient with your money and where other companies may have, they have a lot, so they're a little bit less frugal. How, how much is there like, a, a, is it a friendly competition, would you say, it, or is there any collaboration with so few competitors in the market? Is there collaboration? I'm just curious, like how that, how that works. And ultimately, I, I think the last piggyback to my own question would be like, what are you most excited for in the next two to three years, probably with Rocket Lab? Yeah, yes, there is a lot of collaboration, especially yeah, space systems business. We provide components into a tremendous amount of stuff. I mean, I set the, the team a task that 100% of everything that goes to space at some point should have a Rocket Lab logo on it. Don't care if we launched it, don't care if we built it. And I think last year, I haven't got the numbers for this year, but it was something like between 36 and 38% of everything that went to orbit. That was addressable, so things not in China and whatnot. Somewhere in the 30% of everything that went to space had a Rocket Lab logo on it somewhere. And I think there is a lot of collaboration and there's a lot of mutual respect within the industry because in many instances, take our solar, for example, there's three companies worldwide that can produce a space-grade gas solar cell. So by by necessity, there has to be a lot of kind of collaboration in that respect. And then the thing I'm most excited for, I guess the thing that's most fulfilling in a lot of ways is seeing the business model coming together, seeing us starting to win uh, programs or be involved in, in programs that I wouldn't have thought that we would have had the ability to have done this soon. We've got two spacecraft that we're building for NASA that are going to Mars next year. And generally, you get to build interplanetary spacecraft after you've proven yourself for a couple of decades, not like within the first few years of you starting to build spacecraft. And, and if you look at the, the, the kind of the, the, the depth and technical challenges of the projects and things that we're, we're building, it's super fun. I think that's the best part is seeing the business model come together, seeing the power of owning your own rocket, owning your own, and all of the, the efficiencies that brings not just to the business, but to, to your customers, I think is very satisfying. Well, one, one last one, because this is just on the tip of my mind, because everyone's talking about Mars over and over mm-hmm. again. Do you think in our lifetimes we'll go beyond Mars? And I guess a fun question is, where wh- which planet would you like to most visit if it was available for humanity to, <laughs> to live on? So I assume you mean actually moving the sack of flesh to a, to a different planetary location and 
if that's the, the question, then I have no desire. I, I don't even want to go into low with orbit. I have no desire. I'm, unfortunately, I understand all the engineering and all the risks and share none of the courage to address them. I have immense respect for, for any astronaut who, who, who is able to both understand the risks and then just seemingly dislodge them from being a concern. But I think it's, it's just a matter of time until there's a footprint on Mars. I think the reason for that is, is political as anything else. I think China making great leaps. There'll be a Chinese footprint on the moon sometime soon. When that happens, there's going to have to, there's going to have to be many more fo- footprints. And I think as much as the Apollo program was was just a huge testament to human innovation, it was political and almost it, controversial in, in, in the fact that one, one superpower had to prove that they were better than the other. And I think that you'll see the same thing with Mars. I think nations that put a footprint on, on, on the moon are not going to stop at the moon. Yeah, I think it's inevitable. I think it's super exciting. The planet I most want to visit without actually going there is Venus. I think Venus is the most underrated planet in our solar system. We have so much to learn from that planet. So that would be the one the one I spend my time on. Why do you say that, just out of curiosity? So much to learn about Venus over the summer. Oh, months. man, look, geez, we can, now we're really, we, we could really spend <laughs> the next day on this one. But two reasons, and Rocket Lab has a small private mission to Venus. It's a kind of a nights and weekends project that we're trying to get there. It's there's a there's a reasonable not a reasonable but there is some probability that there may be life in the clouds of Venus, and I think answering that question for humanity is a big deal. If we want to take the scientific approach right now, there is we have no evidence of life off Earth, therefore you have no conclusion to draw. But the, we are the only life in the universe. Now I think that's very cynical and most likely not true. But if we want to be scientific about it, <clears throat> we have no evidence to prove to the contrary. If you could go to Venus, say and found some form of life in the clouds of Venus, then everything changes. Firstly, we're not the only life in the universe. Secondly, if it's in the clouds of Venus, it's most likely prolific throughout the universe. And I think that's a totally different spectrum of view or outlook on humanity than the one we have today. Well, well, I'm such curious a now. Great answer <laughs> compared I wanted, to my I question. I want to know the answer now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Will, will we in the future have something like an investor day where fans, because Rocket Lab is mo- uh, one of the most sympathetic companies in the world, where fans get the chance to get in contact with the company, with the guys working, because we have seen it in other companies doing things like that, and it's an awesome event for us. Mm. Is there a small chance? Yeah, I'll let me talk to the team about it. Yeah, 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 sure. I'll see what the logistics of making something like that happen are. We should just make it like the first launch of of Neutron and just everybody should just come to the launch site. That would be much more efficient. Yeah, that, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. Nico, you're changing the world right now with that question. <laughs> so thank you so much, Peter, for coming on Pounding the Table. I agree. We could have spent another two, three hours asking you questions. Really excited to see the future of what you guys are building over at Rocket Lab. And maybe in a year or so, we can get you back on and, and see all, all the advancements you guys have made. I really appreciate That'd it. That'd be great. My pleasure. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much.